Good afternoon, guys and gals. Thank you so much for joining us again. It is Monday, July 20th. My name is Tyler Fenn, uh, and I'm uh, joined by Joe Rosen. Joe, thanks for uh, being with us again here on the podcast. It's my pleasure, man. I love Red X, so anything I can do to help the community. Absolutely. And welcome to those of you who are jumping on. Uh, Pat, Robert, thank you for being with us. Uh, and thank you to everybody else who's listening, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, or on our website. Uh, thank you. Be, make sure if, if, as you have questions for Joe, we're going to talk about some awesome stuff today. As you have questions, chat those in. Those will get relayed over to me and we'll uh, we'll talk and uh, get some education here from Joe. But Joe, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I uh, pre-show everybody my computer just died. So if for whatever, if, if I cut out for whatever reason, it's just going to be Joe Rosen taking everybody to school today. So let's, let's hope do it, baby. Computer. Either way, it's let's... a win-win. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, Joe, I'm, I'm super excited. Again, you've been a guest on the podcast before, uh, and it was a fantastic podcast. We, uh, we are excited. We've got Robert. We've got people commenting in. They're going, man, we love his energy. Welcome, Joe. So people are excited to listen to you today. Yeah. I want to talk because this is a crucial thing. So before we get into lead follow-up, and if we even get to that, um, let, let's talk a little bit about why, right? Let's let's talk a little bit about that because because I think that you'll be able to educate us here because that's important, mm -hmm. right? And um, we mentioned just briefly pre-show, everybody everybody has a why, but I think that 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 why is easy to remember when things are good, but it's when things are hard that that why really matters. But I think that's most often when people forget that. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Uh, so, so, so how, so what is the why? Tell me, tell me, tell me what drives you and what motivates you and, and, and how, maybe people can take some things from that and, uh, and, and analyze their own business a little. Yeah. So I think that, um, we're going to get into hopefully the difference between motivation and discipline. That's a big part for me too. Um, but for me, right. I've always believed that there's a why that pushes you and a why that pulls you. Uh, I think there's a positive why and a negative why, right? And I think that everybody likes to focus on that positive why. And I'll tell you what my positive why is because it's the one that everybody likes to discuss. It's simple. It's easy. It's fun. Uh, and that is I like to challenge myself. I've, I've always been, you know, I had brothers growing up. So it was a fight to get the treat. And it was uh, then it led into football. And, hey, if, you know, you want to be normal. You come over here. If you want to be above average, then you better get to your butt, your butt into the gym and, and work harder. You got to put more effort in. So I've grown up in a competitive uh, environment my whole life. When I got into the army, it got even more competitive. And I've just always had that desire to, I, I honestly don't care about the money at all. The money's cool. It gives you a lot of great opportunities to do bigger, better things, but it's the challenge, man. I want to challenge myself every day, every month, every year to get bigger, better, to produce more, to give better service to my clients, better service to my team members. Always find the best technology, whatever it is. It's that challenge that drives me. But then going to the negative why, uh, when I was in the army, I was in for 10 years, I was in Afghanistan and deploying, being away from the family, all that stuff. Uh, you ask for that when you come in, you know, what you're, you're right. signing up for. So, you know, don't feel bad for any of those guys. They chose that. But when you have little kids, uh, right now my kids are four and seven. So I think my littlest was probably months old and my older one was probably about three. Uh, I was gone to Afghanistan. And it's really tough because of what we did. We go on a mission. That might, mission might be a day. It might be three weeks. You have no idea. And it's it's not because it's a secret. It's because it depends on what happens. Do we go in there and kick butt and we're back home? Or do we get our butt kicked for a little bit and it's going to take a little bit? You don't know. So I remember making that phone call. Like It's so vivid to me. I can see it as if I was a third-party outsider looking at it. And I remember everybody got the phones for, for whatever it was, two minutes, three minutes. And... I got my chance at the phone. You get to call home. And I remember getting my little girl and she was three years old and she started crying and she was sad and she, she, she wanted her dad. And I was so sad because I knew after she spit that out, I only had about 35 more seconds with her and I have to reassure her. I haven't even talked to mom. I haven't even talked to the other one. And oh my, like all the emotion, all the stress, all the frustration. And I still got to be professional because I was a leader. I wasn't just a soldier. I was a non-commissioned officer. And all of a sudden your time is up and you don't want to be disrespectful to everybody else. So I hang up and I just remember like going in the corner and just, I was so frustrated. And I thought like, I love the army. I love my country. I love fighting. But at that point, uh, I think I'd put enough in. 
I'd given, I'd, I'd given our country enough. And I thought I need to get out and I need to give my family a little bit more of me. And I never want to be in a position again where I need to work for somebody else or I need to answer to somebody else. Everybody wants to get out of whatever it is they're doing for a job because they don't want to listen to their employer. They got bigger, better ideas, whatever it is. But a lot of times when they say they want to leave for freedom, the freedom means I want to go to the beach all day, right? That's what they really right. mean. They don't right. want to do the work. I want to make a bunch of money, but I don't want to do the work. You can't do that. You have to go after it. And for me, that's what fires me up. Every day when I lose my motivation, when I lose my fire for the day, I think about that moment. And I think you better kick it into another gear. Or if you don't, every single time you don't, you're risking going back and working for somebody else. And then I just push forward fast and hard. So for me, there are a couple whys back there. But it's also making sure that you maintain awareness of them. Because if I sit down with a soldier in the army right now, someone on my team, and I have that discussion with them and say, what is your why? Why are you doing this? We'll talk it through. They'll come up with it. They'll write it down. They'll agree with it. They'll buy into it. And then 30 days from now when they're being lazy, and I'll say, hey, what about that why? I'll get a little boop, a little blip from them. Like, oh, yeah, I forgot about the why. So you can't just have the why. You can't just think of the why. You can't just write the why down. You have to have some sort of apparatus to keep that why in front of you, always pushing that through your brain. So, so that that story, right? I've got kids, and as you're as you're telling this story, right? I like I'm getting emotional. Going, that is a terrible position no. to be in, right? That no. is that is hard. Um, and 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 for you to be able to draw on that is 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 so huge right for yeah. you be able to be able to remember to go i don't ever want to feel like that again i don't yeah. ever want to feel like that and that's that's huge but what about what what about somebody who doesn't have a defining experience like that that they can draw on right and and maybe that's where maybe that's these people that you just get like a boop right they there's a little bit of productivity yeah. but there's not something that's so how do you how do you connect the emotion to, to the activity that you have to go through every single day, because that's maybe that's I'm hearing that's maybe where a disconnect is. Yeah, that's really tough because you're right. When I think of the biggest studs that I've ever met in the military, uh, when I think of the biggest studs I've ever met in real estate, I, look at like Tony Robbins is a stud. If you go back and you listen to his yes. why, it's it goes back to his childhood and how it was horrendous and his his dad's relationship with him. David Goggins, you know who David Goggins is? Yes, yes. That guy is a stud. Yes. But when you look at his why, it stems from all the horrendous things that happened as a child. And I was I joke with my wife because we talk about this a lot. Uh -huh. I said, honey, we just got to give our kids a horrible childhood. And they will be so successful. Now, obviously, you can't do that, right? You want to give your kids a great childhood, but you also need to add some adversity. And I think so many of us hadn't had enough adversity in our life. Everything's just been sweet and nice and cuddly and comfy. So a lot of people, especially those, now I'm beating on the younger folks, they come out, they've never had any adversity. They expect everything, they get it. And they're part of that 87% that fail within five years, right? So for you, you have to be aware of that. You have to realize that. And you have to create something in your head. And those positive whys are fun. They're the ones that every time you go to one of those big Tony Robbins functions or something like that, they're the ones they're going to have you write down. Yes. You got to think of the negative one, the crappy one, the one that's really going to – like what if you fail? What if you don't put in the work, you don't put in the effort, your business fails, it tanks, and now you got to explain to your wife, your husband, your kids, your mom, your dad, your friends back home, whoever, that you failed. How is that going to feel? Are you going to be embarrassed? What, what are you going to do? Are you going to have to go work for somebody? Is that going to suck? Because now you're working maybe eight-hour shifts, maybe 12-hour shifts. Maybe it's eight some weeks and it's 12 the next. It sucks, but you're yes. at the will of somebody else. I don't ever want that. And you have to think that through and you have to be mature enough to take the steps to think that through because real estate, you're not working for anybody, man. It's your business. I don't care that you're for, with a brokerage or you've got a coach or you've got a team leader. Everybody on my team, they're running their own damn business. I help them. I mentor them, but it's their business. So if they fail, it's on them. So you really need to think of those things with a mature mindset and build your own why. And you're right. The less adversity you've had, the more challenging it is, but that is where maturity comes in. Yeah, and that's amazing. And and you mentioned you mentioned David Goggins, right? His book uh, can't hurt me, right? I think that's the name of it. Can't yeah. hurt. I mean, yeah. you, you read that book, and 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 I, I experience the same emotions as I'm putting myself in your shoes, right? As yeah. you're making this two minute phone call, 
and, and and like even as I'm thinking about this, right, I get a little emotional going, I'm a father. How do I do that? And and I think you're right. There's this if you haven't had those experiences, there's a process to there's a process to train your mind to go. Yeah, maybe there's not one experience that I'm drawing on, but but there's an emotion that I have to attach to to what's going to happen if I don't succeed. Yeah. Right. And yeah. um, and for some people, I, I think for a lot of people, it might be looking back going, yeah, I don't want to work for somebody else. But you have to tie that emotion to it so that your activity yeah. will continue to reflect. Right. So let's talk a little bit. You mentioned this. And I think this is a natural segue into this is the difference between motivation and discipline, yeah. because I think that's where. I think that's the key, right? Is is yeah. motivation is fantastic, but discipline is what takes motivation and turns it to action, right? Yep. So let's talk about that a little bit because um, because there is a difference, even though maybe people don't don't think that. So what's the difference between yeah. motivation, right? This desire to go out and do something, and discipline that that really takes that motivation, turns it into something. I love that you asked this because I've been wanting to watch The Last Dance forever. And I just, I'm so busy, I don't have time to figure out which subscription I have to have to get it. And I just I kind of forgot about it. And I noticed it popped up on Netflix last night. And I watched two episodes. And I like, boom, I shut off the TV. I went to bed a half an hour early. I woke up a half an hour early. And I got to work. And all day I've been thinking, I'm the Michael Jordan of real estate. I'm the Michael Jordan of real estate. And I'm just, like, I don't care what anybody says. I am out to crush it. And that's how I felt all day long. And I guarantee that's going to last two, three, four, five days. Maybe it'll last a week or two. Right. That's motivation. Motivation is me coming in and yelling at you and firing you up. Tony Robbins giving you a big rah-rah speech with fire behind him. And that's motivation, right? Motivation dies out. It's fun. It's awesome. It feels good. It's interesting, but it dies out. Every single time, I don't care who you yes. are, it dies out. Discipline is you being mature enough to know it's going to die out. And when it does die out, still do the thing you know you need to do to be successful. That is what's important. So I think so many people want, I'll talk about a team. I attract a lot of people because of the energy I have on my team, I attract a lot of people who aren't motivated and they look at me as the magic pill. And I tell them, listen, that, that's not why you're coming on this team because it's not going to happen. I'll make you successful for a month, but after a while, you're going to get sick of me yelling and, you know, get to this and do this. And you got to pretty soon you're just going to be annoyed because if you don't want to do it yourself, you're not going to like me telling you you have to do it. And I'm not your boss. I'm the team leader, but it's your business. So you have to want to do it when you don't necessarily feel like doing it or it's not going to matter anyway. So for me, discipline, again, it goes back to maturity, right? Like everybody can do it when they're motivated. You need to do it at whatever your minimum standard is every single time, whether you want to do it or not. So, so I, I'm with you, right? I think that I think, and I, and I like the way you said this, you said, um, hold on, let me think exactly how you said this. You said you have to be mature enough to recognize that motivation dies. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, we all love, I, I personally, I love, love, motivational speakers, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's some books that you listen to, or when I get to, when I get to see people speak live, you walk away from those and it's like, yes, there, yeah, there's dude. like this, there's like this burning in your bosom yeah. and you're like, I can do anything. anything. But that, yeah. Like you said, that lasts, uh, you know, ask any gym owner, right? That lasts yeah. Days, a weeks, little while. Whatever. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think, I think you said it right is there's a maturity that we have to like this emotional awareness that we have to have where we go, I'm not going to feel like this forever. And you have to, you have to build this. And so I'm, I'm super excited that you're a military man, right? Because I, I think, I think any book you listen to that talks about dis or listen to, right. You can tell I'm an yeah. audible user, any book that you read that talks about discipline, there's going to be some reference back to the military. Yeah. So let's talk about this for just a little bit. How do you create discipline? And, 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 and that's like the million dollar question, right? Yeah. But in your experience, how does somebody create discipline so that they can last through the times when motivation is low? Well, and I'll tell you, that's a, a big part of the military's attraction to a lot of these younger people, right? And it was a big attraction to me. I was a salesman. Uh, I sold real estate in Minnesota and I could sell. I was selling but I was blowing more money than I was making. It didn't matter how much I made. I was blowing it on the wrong things. 
And I wasn't leading a healthy lifestyle, physically, mentally, any of that. And I was just, I was going down the wrong path, man. So for me, I had to get that discipline. And what the military does is it takes you and it forces habits into your life. And at first it just sucks, right? Like basic training is exactly that. It's basic. It's not tough. If you were in the top, like literally nine tenths of America, you can make it through basic training. If you're 350 pounds, you can make it through basic training. Does it suck? Oh yeah, it sucks, but you're going to be just fine. Right. But what it does is it makes you get up early. It makes you put your bed together. It makes you fold your clothes in a very specific way. It also teaches you that because you and I might look at what does a bed made look like? What is it defined as? Your definition might be a little bit different than my definition. The army has regulations that tell you this is exactly what a win looks like. This is what a loss looks like with everything. And everything you do is competitive. Everything has a yes and a no, a go and a no go, a win and a loss. And so you just get that beat into you. If you show up on time, you're late. You have to be 10 minutes early. That's how it works. If you're nine minutes early, the NCO is going to smoke the hell out of you while you're sitting there in formation. Everybody else will be talking about business, you're going to be doing push-ups until I get tired watching you. Once that happens a couple times, you learn, I better be 10 minutes early because that pain sucked. And it's like that with everything. Every single thing we do, there's policies and procedures. There's a way to do it. And, and it doesn't matter if it's the most efficient way. It matters that we're all doing it the same way. So there's no questions asked. Once that happens over a period of time, you just get used to it. I mean, you and me both, right? We have different habits that we implement into our day so we can be more efficient. We can be more productive. We can communicate better, whatever it is. At first, it sucks. You got to think about it. You're probably failing a couple times here and there. You're doing it wrong. You're not efficient. You have to keep doing it over and over and over and over and over. And after about three, four, five weeks, it's just, that's how my day goes. That's just, that's who I am. It becomes a habit. It becomes discipline. But you have to stick with it through that, you know, I'm making up three, four, five weeks, but whatever that period of time is, you've got to have the mental capacity and the maturity to say, I'm going to stick with it no matter what, so that I know I get that end goal, which is the ease of this particular habit. I, I, I love that. And I totally agree. Right. But the, and that's the challenge is sticking with it long enough till it becomes routine. And, yeah. and uh, I, I think if you, if you look at a, a lot of new agents that get into the business, right. That's not that they lack discipline as a person, yeah. but they lack discipline in their business. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, and I think that um, I, I think that's, I think it's awesome, right. Having somebody like you as a mentor to go, look, this, this is what you're going to continue yeah. to do. But like you said, it's yeah. on them. They've got to be the ones to run their own business and build those, those habits and things. So let's talk a little bit. Um, I think that we could probably do a whole series of podcasts on motivation and discipline alone, oh, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. we could, we could, and, and maybe there's an idea there, Red X admin guys, is maybe there's uh, something there. But um, yeah. let's talk about how this relates to lead follow up, yep. okay? Is, is, which is a big, which is a big topic that we've been talking about on the podcast a lot. And, and part of that is simply because um, it's an area where a lot of agents don't have that discipline. And, yeah. and it's, and sometimes it's not that, like I said, they don't have it themselves. They just don't have that in their business. And sometimes it's because they don't know what they don't know. Yep. And, uh, and so let's talk about that a little bit about uh, some systems, some processes and things that agents use that, that once disciplined to be able to do that, can can have massive massive payoffs in their business. So um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put the ball in your court a little bit and talk to talk about lead follow up because this is such a huge thing and we could go a lot yeah. of directions. But I'd also love to hear from some of the listeners, right? As we talk about lead follow up, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or on our website, as you have questions about how to do this, how to create discipline in your lead follow up, maybe about the systems and processes, please chat those in. We'll get this over to Joe. Um, mm. So far in the 20 minutes we've been talking, right? I think that people recognize, they go, okay, here's a guy that we can learn some stuff from. So uh, please listen as your listeners. And we've got a lot of our regulars on Amanda, Pat, thank you for being with us. Um, make sure to chat those questions in here as you have them, but let's talk about lead follow-up. Let's talk about creating discipline to do that uh, because that's where real money's made, right? Yeah. That's where business really takes off for everybody. So how do we have effective lead follow-up, right? How do, how do we do that? Yes. And the cool thing about being experienced is I have failed for you guys, right? I can tell you exactly what I did that I wouldn't say it didn't work, but it didn't work as well. 
And I can also get into what is now working really well for me, right? So what didn't work was, and I'll go even worse than what I was doing, right? I've seen a lot of agents where I've even had new agents come to me and I'm like, okay, let's get your CRM out. What, what CRM are you using? What's the CRM? I'm like, dude, what? Okay. So in the last month, whatever prospecting you've done, anybody who gives you a little bit of interest, where are you tracking those people? Oh, I'm a sticky notes. Cool. Where are your sticky notes? Oh, they're on my desk at home. How many are there? Like four, like four, dude, that's what you should get in a half an hour. What are you talking about? So I, I think just getting a CRM period is your first step. Like it is magical what a CRM can do for you. Right. Um, so my CRM, because I was cheap was a, an Excel spreadsheet. And I'd put it in there and I put the next call date in there. And then when I got done with all my calls, I'd highlight them all and I'd sort them in order of next call date again. So it put all of them back to the top again. And uh, that works. It's it's like really fancy sticky notes, but it's still super slow. And once you right. see what CRMs can do for you, uh, it's absolutely amazing how efficient you can be. So let's get to your initial question, which is like lead follow up, right? Uh, a buddy just told me this statistic. I hope I'm repeating it correctly, that there was a Harvard uh, business study and it said, okay, how many uh, follow-ups do you need to make on average to actually get a deal done, right? So when you look at the deals that actually get done, how many times did you have to contact them before it happened? And it was seven point something, right? Mm -hmm. So for some, you might need to contact them 15, 20 times. For some, it's once or twice, but on average, it's seven something. But they say the average realtor will follow up 1.5 times, okay? Now, I might not be remembering these numbers 100% correctly, but they're pretty doggone close. So what you're seeing is a huge disparity between what you need to do and what they're actually doing. And I think if you want to look at lead gen, people get... They get frustrated with lead generation. I got to put in time. I got to make the call. I got to get rejected. All these negative things that are associated with it. But I'll tell you, if you're only following up 1.5 times, I can see why you're frustrated. I'd be frustrated too. You have to add that element. And, and I think it's really important to separate lead gen and follow up into two different time blocks of your day, it, which my gosh, I just said like 17 things. Blocking off your time is absolutely critical. If you just wake up and you show up to work sometime between eight and nine o'clock and you just start making calls until you get bored and then maybe I'll go into my CRM and make some follow-up calls, it's never gonna happen. My whole day is filled with people getting in touch with me in ways that I wasn't planning for, at times I wasn't planning for, wanting me to get back to them in ways and times that I haven't planned for. So you need to have as much structure to your time as you can. And once you block that off, the first two things for me that are absolutely critical is CRM time and new lead generation time. And they should be appointments. And I can't tell you how often people will say, well, I haven't made calls because this popped up or I haven't made follow-ups because that popped up. Uh, are you going to say no to a listing appointment because something pops up? No, you're not. You're going to go. You need to go make your calls and you need to go follow up through your CRM because that is the lifeblood of everything that you have. And if you let that go, your, your whole business is slow for the next 90 days. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and as it, you know, being here at Red X, I've been here over 12 years. I've talked to lots of new agents, right? And there's typically one piece of advice that I try to give mm -hmm. when somebody, when, when we're having this type of conversation, and that's, you've got to, you've got to be in control of your calendar. Yeah. You've got to be in control of your time because there are so many distractions nowadays. And, and sure, I mean, I, I, somebody, somebody, a friend uh, uh, texting me and saying, you know, hey, can can I get a uh, do a desktop appraisal for me? You know, what's my house worth? Yeah. Can you pull some yeah. comps? Like, like that's related to business, but it's not directly related to mm -hmm. making money. Yep. And so, and so, there's things that come up that we go, oh, well, this is important, and it helps me feel like I'm being busy. But at the end of the yeah. day, we go. What did I get done? Yeah. And a lot of that is because people aren't in control of what they're doing with their time. And so that block time, I couldn't agree with you more, right? Is, is having prospecting and follow-up, having those in your calendars to go, this is sacred time for me to generate new contacts. And this is sacred time for me to follow up with those. That word sacred, 
is yeah. absolutely the key, man. I'm going to add two. I, I said there were two important blocks, right? Follow up and lead gen. I want to add a third one, which is create tomorrow's schedule today. Because if you don't do that, you're going to have a schedule today. And then tomorrow morning, you're not. And then you'll be like, oh my God, today was horrible. So then you're going to make one the next day and then forget the next day. Every day I've got 15 minutes blocked off where I just go in and create my schedule. Nothing. It's just like another appointment, right? Just like a listing appointment, just like every other appointment. It's an appointment with me to create the successful day I want to have tomorrow. And another plus to that is when I show up tomorrow as employee me, I report to executive me, CEO me yesterday who created that schedule for employee me. I don't have to think. I'm spending zero time thinking. All I'm doing is executing really fast. And for 15 minutes a day, I slow down, put my CEO cap on, and I build my next day. Well, and I and and you've you've touched on this whole different aspect that we haven't even brought up, right? About accountability, yeah. right? And and wearing these hats is going to have to be accountable to myself. And sure, nobody's going to slap me on the wrist. Yeah. But then then it goes back to how we started the conversation, right? What's the why? Why do you do what yeah. you do? Uh, and uh, and I and I love that again. Accountability. That's a whole other thing that we could get into and methods of doing that. Uh, but but I think that your why, what we started with, should be the underlying foundation for that. Absolutely. Is, is I want to, like you said, I'm competitive. That drives me. Yep. And and what pushes me, right? Like the the competition pulls me. But what pushes me yeah. is the fact that you want to be free. You want to have time with your family. You don't want to work for anybody else. You don't want to go back to that two minute phone call with your three year old, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and that's that is that is awesome. So we've talked about a couple of things here. We talked about about three time blocks, right? Is is it's time to prospect and, and generate new leads. You talked about time to follow up with those leads. Yep. Let's focus on that a little bit more, right? Because there's this gap between how many times agents follow up and how many times they need to follow up, yeah. right? And it's a big gap. Jeez. So what is what does that look like in your business? What does lead follow up look like? How often are you following up? What methods are you using to do that to make sure that you are not letting anything slip through the cracks? Yeah. So everybody who comes into our CRM, uh, we give them a state. Right. And that stage basically, it, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect, but it lets you quickly think how interested are they in making a move right now? Right. So we've got, I'm making these up off the cuff here, but I think active client is, we follow up with them literally every day and okay. it's a call every single day. Now, if they don't like calling and everything else and they're like, hey, would you please text me? Sure, we'll text you, right? Whatever you want. But it's a call first unless you tell us otherwise. And I think that's critical. A lot of people want to text. They want to Facebook DM. They want to email because it is efficient, but it doesn't give you – like you have to do voice to voice. There's so much emotion. There's so much fear. There's so much concern that you get out of that person if you have that voice to voice. You're not going to get that in a text. I just had a really good friend of mine, one of my mentors, call me. This was about a month ago. Said, Joe, I've got good news and bad news. I said, what's the good news? He said, you're going to be a better agent tomorrow. I'm like, mm, yes. <laughs> what's the bad news? He's like, I stole a listing from you. I was like, really? He said, yeah. They said you kept texting them. You never called them. They didn't like that. And so they went with me because I actually called them. I was like, son of a gun. But that's fair, right? I, I, I didn't yeah. do the right thing. So that's an important lesson to learn and actually getting that voice to voice. But uh, so anyway, I've got the call every three days if they're doing something in the next 30 days. Uh, then I've got, it's called a short-term nurture. It's once a week. I've got a long-term nurture. It's once a month. And then we've got, it's called a prospect, which you don't have a timeline. So we get in touch with them every three months. And it's uh, email or text, email or text, email or text. And then after 12 months, it's a phone call, right? Because you have to get that voice to voice. Um, and then we've got unresponsive. I'll even put people, if, if I call people and they're like, Joe, go screw yourself. Awesome. I add them to my CRM and I put them as unresponsive. So if they ever in the future are like, you know what? That big bald headed idiot can sell me a house. Fine. When they call me back, I've got all their information up and I can see when I call them all their house information, all that good stuff. So I think it's important to, and, and I was taught this, I didn't come up with this. Think of your market as son of a gun. Why is it not in my CRM yet? And every interaction you have with anybody, you're just putting them in there. Lender, put them in there. Inspector, put them in there. Buyer, put them in there. Your family member, put them in there. Everybody needs to be in your doggone CRM. And that is the hub where everything comes out of. But yeah, for me, it's really dependent upon when I think they're going to pull the trigger. And you can make up, is it going to be a week? Is it going to be seven days? Is it going to be six days? Is it going to be 14 days? 
And I, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer there, but you've got to add a lot of voice. It's got to be voice heavy. So let's let you you mentioned these four categories, right? Somebody who's going to take action in the next 30 days. And then you mentioned short term and long term nurture. What's the difference between those two? Yeah, short term is 30 to 90 and long term is I think it was 90 to 6 months. Okay. And then and then everybody else maybe falls under prospect or or yeah. or or this unresponsive category. Yeah, if we're if a good, yeah. Okay, now if you're if you're let, let's talk about the 30 day people, right? The, it, you call these your active clients, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean active listing. It's just that you're actively you're actively driving them toward a transaction. Is what that is that is that accurate? Yeah, I've got active and hot. Hot is they're okay. doing something in the next 30 days. Active is if it's a buyer, we're actually out looking at houses. Gotcha. Right? Okay. Like, all I got to do is find them the house. They're going to pull the trigger. And if it's a seller to sign right now they're just waiting on me i just need to get the photographer in there i did, like they're waiting on me i'm the problem not them gotcha. that is active yeah hot is they're gonna do something in the next 30 days so let so then let's move to the short term and, and the long term short term you said you said you're reaching out to them once a week the long term i think you said once a month so let's talk about the short term people how does that follow up what does that look like you'd mentioned you like to be voice heavy is that true in these short term prospects where you're reaching out once a week yeah. Or are you using different methods also? I just pulled it up because I want to make sure I was giving you exactly what I'm doing. Okay. It goes back and forth. It's uh, email or text, and then it's a call. Email, text, then a call. Email, text, then a call. Uh, with the long terms, it's the same thing. It's only the prospects that are email, text three times, and then it's a call on the fourth time, right? Because it, it does, it, it gets to be burdensome. Like once once your funnel gets big enough, if you're doing what I'm suggesting, which is being call heavy, um, you're making a ton of phone calls. And that's on top of your cold calls. Right. So you do have to find that sweet spot of where you're going to be efficient, right? And if I do start to have so many people, right, these are, these are warm leads in my funnel, I will reduce the amount of voice that I'm doing. I'll change those, those action plans and make them a little bit more efficient. I'll reduce the voice. It's not because I want to, it's because I want to stay in front of all of those great leads, right? Or I'll take somebody on my team and I'll, I'll add, well, what if I don't have a team? I'll get into that. I'll take someone on my team and I'll say, listen, you don't have any leads right now. I want you to go through all of these prospects that I just can't possibly keep in contact with. And I want you to spend the next 30 days calling 200 a day, right? Anything you get, you just take it, man. Um, if, you, if you're like, hey, I don't have a team. I didn't have a team when I got here. So I found agents. They weren't even at my brokerage. They were just agents I liked that I knew were new. I knew I trusted them. They were hardworking. They just didn't have the experience. And I'd call them all the time and be like, hey, I got a lead. I can't keep up with it. Can I give it to you? And we'll do a 25% referral. Cool. Sounds good. And I give them everything, right? And I trusted these guys. Now that I got a team, I don't have to do that because we're making money off the split. So I can just give it to them. But it's really important to have your system and your system, like, listen, my system's going to change in six months. Like I said, if I get so many people in there, I can't keep up. I'm going to have to do less voice or I'm going to have to build a bigger team. I'm going to have to do something, but uh, just really focus on trying, trying to be as heavy voice as you can. Well, and, and you've mentioned something that's really crucial is, is you mentioned in six months, it's going to change for me. I think that a lot of times we get to the point where we go, Hey, I've built this system. Now I'm sticking to yeah. it. And, yeah. and that can be a real pitfall, right? Is, is we're not willing to adapt. We're not willing to analyze the results because we go, I spent so much time building this, yep. but it has to live as a working document, a living document, right? Or as Absolutely. a living process, you've got to be able to make changes and things. And, and, uh, and I think that's crucial. You mentioned that. Um, and I think it's crucial that people understand that you can't just yeah. build it and, and it's not a set it and forget it type process. It's yeah. a, We've got to continue to work on this to make sure that we're optimizing uh, yeah. on a regular basis. So there's a couple of questions that have come in here. Um, I'm going to ask Stephen's question first, and then I'm going to get to Amanda's. Um, Stephen asks, he says, do you have a follow-up system within Red X? And so uh, we, we know you're a big Red X user, big Red X guy, which we appreciate very much. How does that tie into your CRM? How do you use those two in tandem? Because if I had to guess, I'd say probably 60% of our customer base use them together. What does that look like in your business where you're using Red X to generate leads and we've got a whole system there, but then you're using a CRM? Yeah. So um, I know you guys have either a, you have a CRM or I would, like, I'd call it a lead manager. It's not quite as okay. robust as, as, yeah. as some of these others that are out there, but okay. it's designed specifically to follow up with your leads to get them to the point where yeah. 
I'm ready to take action on this person. And so, and I'll tell you, like just about everything that I do, it's because I know people who are more successful than me. They're at the next level. And that's one of the reasons I, I, I'm not pitching brokerage here at all, but it's one reason I went to the brokerage I'm at is because the people that I want to be like, there's one that's a step ahead of me. And there's one that's two steps ahead of me. I'm meeting with those guys every two weeks each to see what are you doing? What are you changing? What did you get rid of? What are you adding? And I think that that's absolutely critical. Uh, what was, oh, the Red X. So what I do is I use Red X. I love the, what's the dialer? Vortex? Storm. No. Storm. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, oh, Vortex is where all the leads come into. Yeah, yep. okay. Uh, I love the dialer and I, I'm pushing you guys. I hope you guys get into follow-up boss because I'm using follow-up boss. Um, and I think you guys are working on that, but right now I'm using Mojo because of that, right? So I'm taking all the Mojo data. I'm putting it into, I'm sorry, Red X data, putting it into the Mojo dialer. Mojo integrates with follow-up boss. And then a lot of things can come into follow-up boss, right? So if we've got uh, Zillow leads, if we got Ylopo leads, if we got w whatever, there's a slew of different leads you can get after, they can all come in there and I got one hub. But that driving force, if, if you're an absolute stud and you're really busy, just get in the follow-up boss and do your job, right? But if I've got guys who are newer and they need to add to that, right? You have to get into Red X. You have to get that data. You can take that data and you can put it into your dialer, whether it's, you know, whatever dialer it is. And then that dialer, I, I think it's really important to follow up with. If you're going to use that dialer and you're going to, and you have to have a CRM. I can't stress how important it is to have a good, strong, efficient CRM. It changes completely. I'll give you an example here in a second, how much you can keep in front of people and do it efficiently. Right. But if you do it the way I'm saying, I'll just get into it right now. What I was doing was I wanted to contact like my follow up might be 40 or 50 a day, right? Well, I would get so busy. Maybe I'd do 10 and I would drop 30 or 40 of them. I just wouldn't contact them. Well, the next day I've got another 40 plus the 30 I missed yesterday. I'm at 70 plus I still got to make my cold calls. I'm like, holy crap. So it gets overwhelming once you get busy, right? Um, a good friend of mine, that mentor who's too ahead of me said, listen, man, if you get yourself a good CRM, you can build a text that says, hey, this is Joe. I really want to get in touch with you. I owe you a conversation, but I ran out of time today. So I am going to contact you sometime in the next two or three days. If there's anything you need before I reach out to you, just get in touch with me. And then you can mass text that to everybody, right? So if I'm 30 behind, I just boop, 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 send it to 30 people. It's done in a minute and boom, I've kept in contact with everybody. I might get three or four texts back saying, Joe, I need to talk to you right away tomorrow morning. Cool. You guys just prioritize tomorrow's list for me. Those three or four go to the top and the other, whatever it is, 26 are at the bottom of the list and I, I get in touch with them when I can. But th that whole system is absolutely critical. But yeah, that's exactly how I'm doing it. So uh, that, that leads yeah. me a little bit into uh, into Amanda's question that I said I'd come back to because you said, look, I've got this hub and, and regardless of where everything's coming from, uh, it, it, that CRM makes you so efficient yeah. and so crucial, right? So Amanda asked, she, she asked, can you discuss the system that you use to make contact with your new or online website leads, which mm -hmm. I assume are coming into this CRM. Yeah. Is your process any different when you're reaching out or are you, you, I, you mentioned I'm voice heavy. Yeah. So when those leads come in, are you simply reaching out with a phone call and going, Hey, you were on my website or, Hey, you, you know, you, you saved a search on my, uh, on my website for, for homes or whatever. Yeah. What does that process look like? So it, it depends on how you came into my website, but if you are a, so we've got Y Lopo, right? If you've got Y Lopo coming in, then we've got AI with that. So the AI will kind of interact with them, keeping a text dialogue going just like a person would until I see it. And then I stop the AI and then I can come in and start texting. But one of the first things I'm going to say in that text is, Hey, this sounds really good. I tell you what, maybe we should just talk and we can get right to the point, you know, maybe not that bluntly, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to get to a discussion. That's the whole goal of everything. Um, but if you go organically to my website, not through Y Lopo and you sign up, uh, which I, I forget what, I, I don't know if you can look at any, uh, listings or if you can look at like three or five or whatever it is. And then if you want to look at more, eventually they ask you for your information. Once you get your, once we get your information, it puts it right into follow up boss. I can see where it came from. It assigns it to me, not to my team member. Same with their websites, right? They've got websites. If they come in through there, it goes right to that team member. I don't even see it. 
uh, and it's really efficient. You get a notification through your text. You get an email. It pops up in your inbox and follow up boss. It's like, I don't know if you watched The Office, but Ryan made, what was it called, Wolf? Yeah, Wolf. <laughs> wolf. And he's like, yeah, I got a wolf. It's like, eh, eh, boom, boom. and like the fax machines. Go, there's like 3,000 ways that information, yeah. like you can't miss it, man. So yeah, if someone comes through my website, uh, whether it's through YLOPO or it's organically, that is going to come through follow boss. If it's through YLOPO, then I've got the AI to interact with it until I catch up. Now, do you, do you in your business and your on your team, do you have ISAs or OSAs, people who are doing your prospecting for you? No, uh, we haven't gotten that far yet. I've only been here for 51 weeks, man. Now, I can't say I'm a rookie because I did sell before the army, but uh -huh. we're, we've got a transaction coordinator. Uh, and we've got someone who does, it's a team manager plus does all the social media and the onboarding for the team, right? Which is team manager. Uh, those are the only non sales positions that we've got are the transaction coordinator and the team manager. That's awesome. So, yeah. so it sounds like the CRM for you is crucial, right? You said, look, that is, that is key is having a system. Money. Yeah. Uh, let, let's, let's talk a little bit more about how you utilize that, right? It, we, we talked about, um, we talked about your hot leads, your short term, your long term, and, and then these prospects, right? Yeah. Uh, when you're reaching out to these people that you said, sometimes it's, you know, three, three text messages and then, and then a phone call, right? Or, or yeah. one text message, email, then a phone call. What, 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 what reasons or what excuse do you use to reach out to these people? What is some of the content of those that, yeah. that doesn't feel it doesn't feel like you're a sales guy, right? Um, even though like, let, let's face it, like real estate, you are a salesperson. That's what you do. Yeah. But so often we don't want to come across with, with commission breath, right? So what yep. reasons do you use to reach out to these different people? Um, and then, and then it, it, so let's talk about that. That's a, that's a great question because it alludes to a, a very specific point, which is very important. And it's that I think a lot of newer and just less experienced agents They'll just come at it, right? If I tell them as a team leader, you need to reach out to this guy once a week, they'll just text back and say, hey, it's Joe. Are you thinking about buying? What's going on? Or, you know, maybe not quite that blunt, but it's it's pretty blunt. Yeah. And if you read that, you're feeling this guy wants to make money off of me. My true intent is genuinely, I mean, I tell people all the time, I, I don't care if you buy, sell, whatever. I, don't, I just had a gal today. I was just talking with her. And she said, hey, I got to admit, I was talking to another realtor because I just, I, I felt bad because I knew it was your, your family day and I didn't want to bother you. Do I have to pay that guy or how does it? I said, listen, you need to pick a realtor, but I don't care who it is. You can pick that guy. You can pick me. It doesn't matter. But you really do need to pick one because otherwise you're, you're kind of cheating on both of us. You know what I'm saying? And she was like, I get it now. I fully understand. I didn't fully understand before. I appreciate you telling me. I'm going to call that guy right now and, and let him know. Now, hopefully she actually does that. But I think when you come with the intent of truly helping people and not just to sell, it's incredible how far that will take you to actually sell people, right? Um, so what are some of the things that I say? One of the big things I like to use all the time is, hey, I, I just want to make sure I wasn't leaving you hanging. And then whatever it is you're about to say, right? I'm just following up and I want to see, is there anything else I can do for you? I also like to say, hey, I, I sent you A, B, and C a week ago. I just want to follow up with you. Let me know what I can do and put me to work. I like saying put me to work because it makes it like one of the big tips you hear from people is this guy's lazy. He doesn't want to show yeah. me houses. He lists my house and then I don't hear from him for six months. I think if you present yourself as I want you to work me, let's work. They like that. And they think this guy's going to go the extra mile. So I always like to throw in, what can I do for you? Dot, dot, dot put me to work. Um, I really think too, it's important to just be real with people. I think a lot of agents are scared because what if I turn this one prospect off by saying something that's a little bit more personable um, and it could be viewed as less professional, but I think it's the way to build that rapport, right? So I've said before, um, let me think of an example. I had a guy I was working with for a long time. We were on the road to getting him a house and all of a sudden he had an issue pop up on his credit. Boop, there, there it went, right? And he said something like, man, this really sucks. And I wrote him back a text and I said, listen, man. And I wrote, man, I said, listen, man, you're going to be just fine. You need to figure out what your path moving forward is, get motivated about it, 
and and he was a really religious guy. I said, you're religious, man. Talk to your God, pray about it, find a path forward, and you will be successful. I'm your guy. You let me know when I can help you. But it was a more personal message, right? It wasn't, there was no script. There was no, that wasn't reading anything. There wasn't a preconceived template. It was me truly reaching out to that guy with my genuine feelings. And I think that there's that fine line too between like one of my best friends who I, I take a lot of stuff from, he's got templates for everything. Like those guys are so automated, which is awesome. He's quick. But for me, I think that my conversion ratio is so much higher because does it take me more time? Yeah. But when I give you a message, it's more personal and it connects better with you. So for me, um, I want to make sure I'm not leaving you hanging. How can, how can I get to work for you? And uh, something that really connects with them from whatever you've been talking about. Well, and, and that message that you just shared is really consistent with, with almost everybody, if not everybody that I've interviewed on this podcast is, is, you you have to provide the service and the value or yeah. do the work first, right? It, it, they're all synonyms for the same thing. And it's, yeah. I'm here because I provide a service that you need. Yep. And, I, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Um, the, the money that comes, the commission that comes is, is not the success. It's an indication of the success, right? Yeah. Or it's a byproduct, however you want to yes. say that, right? Is you're there to help someone. Yep. And, it, and, 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 and that mindset pays off in the end, right. Yeah. Is, is kind of what I'm going to say is, is that's the way you follow up with people. You go, look, I'm here to help you regardless of whether or not transactions happen. I'm here to help you. And it, it's, it's interesting because as, as we've interviewed a bunch of people on this podcast and that's this theme, right. Or this, this, this similarity that all of these agents have, I think, I was thinking about medicine the other day and I was like, if every, if every doctor got into it, cause you know, they thought they could make a lot of money. Yeah. There, there wouldn't be so many great doctors, right? Cause the yeah. barrier to entry is really high, yeah. right? You got to go to years yeah. and years of school and lots of debt. Well, there's a barrier to entry to success in real estate and it's not becoming licensed, right? Because it's fairly easy to get a real estate yeah. license. It's doing the work. It's yep. putting in the effort to provide value. Uh, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, I love that, that that continues to come through, that that's how you, you, that's the excuse or the reason that you use to follow up with people yeah. is I am here to help you. I am here to provide you with value and service and we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah. And I'd really push everybody listening to, I mean, I think there's two different mindsets in really anything, but we're, we're on real estate right now. There's, I was just talking to a listing agent the other day and we were looking at three in a particular neighborhood and I knew these people were going to buy one of them. Mm -hmm. And the other two had the seller's disclosures online. I printed them off, gave them to the clients beforehand with a little, you know, a paragraph on each, letting them know where we were on each. And the third one didn't have them. So I called her up and I said, hey, just wonder if I can get the seller's disclosures. I've been in the business for 35 years. I've never sent disclosures to someone before an offer. Have you ever sold a home before? Listen, buddy. That, and I just, at the end, she said, you got it. And I said, sounds good, Judy. Have a great day. Bye. And I hung up and she called me back and she's like, what does that mean? Are you, you going to sell the house? Are you looking at the house? What? I said, yeah, we're going to look at the house. We'll see. And I let her go. We looked at the houses and we ended up going with a different one, but she called me back and she said, Hey, I want some follow-up. And I said, well, we're going to go with another house. Well, did it have something to do with the disclosures? I'm like, no, I don't think so. I mean, we'll never know. Uh, and she kept going and going and going. And she finally said, you know, was it, she kept thinking it was something with those disclosures and she kept saying, what is it then? Why are you? And I said, it has to do with the house, but Judy, I'm going to share something with you. You are making my life a pain in the butt. Like when I talk to you, I think every question I have is going to be like pulling teeth with you. How sexy do you think it is for me to sell that house? It is ugly. I don't want anything to do with that sale. I don't care how much you're paying me. I don't want anything to do with it because it's going to be a train wreck. Because I'm asking you for seller's disclosures and it's a train wreck. These other guys are banging down my door asking me, can I get you more information? I'll show your clients the house and you can make the commission. What You want me to prop you up on my shoulders and carry in? You tell me how I can sell you this house and I'll do it. That's who I want to work with, Judy. I don't want to work with people focused on problems. I want to focus on people working on solutions. And when you as the agent come at it with that attitude of, how do I help you? 
Mr. Agent. How do I help you, Mr. Buyer? How do I help you, Mrs. Seller? And you crush it for them. Don't just do your job. Do 10 times more than they even thought they wanted. Blow their minds and it will completely change the relationship. My people trust me because they know that guy didn't have to do that. It probably hurt his, his chances of selling, but I trust every word he says. So I'm going to move forward with this with half the questions you're normally going to get. I love it. That's, that's, uh, it's amazing. And what's awesome is when you, when you, when that's your mindset, right, is I'm going to provide as much value. I'm going to do as much as I can. Yes. It means that you do get to be selective with who you work with oh, both as clients and other agents on the other side of the transaction is, yep. is, uh, and I think that what we'll see is I think the agents that outlast down markets, right. And, and, Markets are, are weird right now, right? With COVID, people, we, we thought there was going to be all this downward pressure and, and, and there were some blips through a few months there, but I think most people are going, I'm so busy, I, right? It's like no different, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but I think that that's what, that's what makes the difference between agents who outlast markets that have downward pressure is those that go, I'm not in it for the commission. That's the byproduct of the success yeah. that I that I put yeah. in and, and the effort that I put in. And, and that's great, right? We've got to have the commission to pay the bills and keep the doors open. But that's not why we do it. We do it because we want to, like you said early on, I want to fulfill my why. I want to be challenged. And I don't ever want to go back to having to work for somebody else. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I, I'd all day long rather sell less homes to people who are blowing up my Google reviews then to more people who are like, eh, he's okay. He didn't really get back to me, but we got the house. We're, we're happy. I don't yeah. want that. Like that would, that would tear my heart. Like I wouldn't feel good about that at all. I wouldn't be proud about that. When I'm looking at that Michael Jordan documentary, I'm seeing him sit in that chair, man. He's sitting back chest out. He doesn't care about anything. Cause that dude knows, I don't care what you say. I'm the best. I put everything I had into my career. I am the best. I want to put in so much effort that when I'm 50, 60, 70 years old, I can look back and say, I don't give a damn what anybody says, man. I am so proud of what I did for so many people. My attitude, the work ethic I put in, my honesty, my integrity, that I'm just beaming with pride. Well, Joe, I, th I think that's a good place for us to end, right? I think that if every agent could walk away and be able to say that at the at the end of their careers, yeah, uh, they will have done something right in the in the process, which is fantastic. Thank you so much, Joe, for being with us today. We've talked about some amazing stuff. Uh, we'd love to have you back on the show to talk about more amazing stuff. So thank you. If you'll hang tight with us, we'll go over a few things uh, post show. But thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day and uh, and sharing some things with us. Thank you everybody for listening and being with us uh, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube or on our Facebook page or on our, our website. Make sure that you're subscribed to the updates for this podcast. We have the next several weeks booked out Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 1:30 Mountain Time. Uh, okay. there's some amazing guests to talk about more uh, uh, incredible things to uh, to bring value to your business. Make sure you're subscribed to the updates by going to the redx.com and clicking on the podcast uh, the podcast link that's up in the, in the uh, website header and you can subscribe there. Joe, you are the man. Thank you so much for being with man. us. And, uh, and, and thanks for taking time out of your busy day. Everybody, we'll see you on Wednesday.